Good morning. Welcome to Lutheran Church of the Cross on this. Uh, I know for me it's the day, the Sunday after All Saints Day, but it's also the Sunday uh, before Remembrance Day. So it's a, a time of year where we spend time remembering. And our worship this morning will be focused on what it's like to be people of faith during a pandemic. But welcome to those in person, also to those that are joining us. Um, as we this morning, I invite, invite you to remember the place where you are, the treaty lands where you uh, are watching this from. Here we are gathered on the land known for millennia as Mokinsis, where the Bull River meets the Elbow River. Today it is commonly known as Calgary in southern Alberta. This is the traditional homeland of the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, and the peoples of Treaty 7. These are the Nitsitapi people, the Siksika, Pikani, Gaina, Sutna, and Iahe, and the Nakota people, the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley Nations. This acknowledgement is a reminder both of the privilege we enjoy as a result of unjust current and historic systems, and of the imperative to bring greater justice for a shared and sustainable future for all. Let us prepare ourselves for worship with a musical prelude. May the hope to which God has called you, the power of God at work in Christ, and the spirit of wisdom and revelation be with you all. Let us pray. O God of justice and love, you illuminate our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need and awaken us to the needs of others. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
first reading is taken from Amos 5, beginning at the 18th verse. You who wish for the day of Yahweh to come, why do you want it? What will the day of Yahweh mean to you? It will be a day of darkness, not light. It will be like running from a lion only to meet a bear, or like getting home safe at last, only to get bitten by a snake hiding in the corner. Rest assured, the day of Yahweh will be darkness, not light. It will all be gloom without a single ray of light. I despise and reject your, your feasts. I am not appeased by your solemn assemblies. When you offer me burnt offerings, I reject your oblations and refuse to look at your sacrifices of fattened cattle. Spare me the racket of your chanting. Relieve me of the strumming of your harps. Instead, let justice flow like a river and righteousness flow like an unfailing stream. The word of the Lord. Psalm 70. O God, make haste to rescue me. Come to my aid. Let there be shame and confusion on those who seek my life. Oh, let them turn back in confusion, who delight in my harm. Let them retreat, covered with shame, who despise my ruin. But let there be rejoicing and gladness for all who seek you. May those who love your saving help say forever, God is great. As for me, I am needy and poor. Come to me, O God. You are my deliverer and my help. O oh God, do not delay. The second reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning at the 13th verse. Sisters and brothers, we want you to be clear about those who sleep in death. Otherwise, you might yield to grief and lose all hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way God will bring with Jesus all who have fallen asleep, believing in Jesus. We are speaking to you now, just as if Jesus were speaking to you. We who live, who survive until Jesus returns, will have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. No, Jesus will personally come down from heaven with a shout at the sound of the archangel's voice and the trumpet of God, and those who have died in Christ will rise first. Then we, the living, the survivors, will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet Jesus in the air. And thenceforth, we will be with Jesus unceasingly. Therefore, console another with these words, the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the Gospel. The Gospel lesson today is taken from Matthew chapter 25. Then again, the kingdom of heaven could be likened to ten attendants who took their lamps and went to meet the bridal party. Five of them were wise. Five were foolish. When the foolish ones took their lamps, they didn't have any oil with them. But the wise ones took enough oil to keep their lamps burning throughout the night. The bridal party was dis delayed, so they fell asleep. At midnight, there was a cry. Here comes the bridal party. Let's go out to meet them. Then all the attendants rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, Perhaps there won't be enough for us. Run to the dealers and get more for yourselves. So, while the foolish ones went to buy more oil, the bridal party arrived, and those who were ready went to the marriage feast with them. 
and the door was shut. When the foolish attendants returned, they pleaded to be let in. The doorkeeper replied, the truth is, I don't know you. So, stay awake, for you don't know the day or the hour. This is the gospel of the Lord. I bet you've stayed awake nights wondering what a big hit song from the early 1600s might have sounded like. Let me show you what a big hit song of the early 1600s sounded like. wonderful hymn is known as the King of Chorale. It's one of the greatest hymns ever written. It was written in 1597 by Philip Nicolai, who followed Martin Luther as one of the last in the Meistersinger traditions, where the writer of both the text and of the tune were the same person. In not very many years after this, those two jobs were separated with one person writing the text and one person writing the tune. Philip Nicolai was, um, was one of the last of these great Meistersingers um, traditions. He was born in 1556 in Waldeck Hesse in Germany, and he was the third of eight children. Let me just go back. Whoops. Oh, show. Can go back. And back one more. There we go. He was the third of eight children, and he himself was the son of a Lutheran pastor. And just to kind of give you an overview, he died in 1608. His father, as I mentioned, was a Lutheran pastor. And Nikolai was sent to study. In fact, he had a lot of education. Um, his early education was in Hesse, where he had grown up. But then he entered the University of Erfurt. Does that word sound familiar? That's where Martin Luther entered the monasteries at Erfurt. And he also studied at the University of Wittenberg, which was a really important university of the time, in this time post-Reformation. So again, he followed in this wonderful tradition of Martin Luther. He was himself ordained to the ministry. You can see a photo of the church which still stands where he was ordained and appointed his first ministry. And then what happened next in his life was very, very important because he went to Niederwildungen and he became the pastor to Countess Margaret Waldeck and more importantly, a tutor, her son. This was her firstborn son, Wilhelm Ernst, which means that he was the heir of this noble house. He moved around a bit. He passed in different places. And you can see that I... And you can see that 
I've, I've outlined them all for you. It's not important to the story. Just take it that he was very educated. But here in 1596, he became the pastor at Una, Failia. We'll take one more. And in 1597, a terrible plague. This plague, which happened, began in July 1997. In July of that year, over 300 people from his parish died. Just take a minute to absorb that. 300 people from his parish died. What would that do to your heart? These people that you would have been so closely connected to. In August, another 150 people died. In all, during this pandemic, 1,300 people from that area died. Definitely. Um, as it would have been the case in the congregations of that time, as the pastor, Nikolai lived in the house beside the church. And as Pastor Laura talked about, behind the church was the cemetery. So sometimes they had 30 burials. And he, with his home being right beside the church and cemetery, he would have had no release from this trauma of this death that surrounded him. But what really took his heart was when his former student, Wilhelm Ernst Waldeck, died as a result of this pandemic. And so, trying to deal with grief and yet trying to provide some sense of um, hope for his parishioners, he wrote this wonderful treatise, part of which says, I leave this to behind me if God should call me from this world as a token of my peaceful, joyful Christian departure or if God should spare me in health, to comfort other sufferers with whom he should also visit with the pestilence. And then he wrote three hymns. In his whole lifetime, he only wrote four hymns, but two of these hymns that he wrote during this time of pandemic have become known as two of the greatest hymns of German chorale repertoire. One is known as the king of chorales and the other as the queen. And this is an important change in how hymnody was written at this time because hymnody in the time post-Reformation was often citing of scripture, parts of the liturgy, or teaching hymns. I think of the 29 verses of Dear Christians, One and All Rejoice, written by Martin Luther. But now begins a new era, a new development in hymn writing that takes on a more objective, a more personal kind of devotional character. And this, of course, was a result of the personal trials and the tribulations associated with this time. So this great hymn that I played for you, the King of Chorales, known by its German words, Wacket auf, ruft uns die Stimme, wake awake, for night is crying. And as I mentioned, it's known as the King of Chorales, one of the great hymns of our time. And although it was written in 1597, 
It was published in 1509, together with another hymn that you would know, Wie schön leuchtet is, um, Oh, how lovely shines the morning star, which today we associate with Epiphany, but in its time was a funeral hymn. So Wache auf appears in our hymnals as Wake Awake, for Night is Flying. Sorry, we can go on. This is how it appeared in its first publication. And this preface was written by Nikolai. Day by day, I wrote out my meditations, found myself, thank God, wonderfully well. Comforted in heart, joyful in spirit, and truly content. I gave to my manuscript the name and title of A Mirror of Joy to leave behind me, if God should call me from this world, as a token of my peaceful, joyful Christian departure, or, if God should spare me in hell, to comfort other sufferers whom he should also visit with the pestilence. The reason we're thinking about this hymn today is because this hymn is based on the gospel, which we just The story of the ten wise and ten foolish attendants in a bridal party. Some who had the foresight to think ahead to what they might need, and others who arrived without preparation. Of course, this text is often used to remind us. I always think of my mother when I text, you know, who before I left for school every morning would remind me that I should make sure I was well prepared. Make sure you did the same for you. But also in this text, Nikolai very wisely combined it with other ideas to bring comfort. Takes part of or excerpts of Revelations chapter 9. Then I heard like a great multitude, rushing waters and the loud peals of thunder and shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself fine linen, bright and clean, was given to wear. And then the angel to me, write this, Blessed are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. And he also makes reference to Revelations chapter 21. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate of a single pearl. The great street of the city was gold, as pure as transparent glass. In including this little excerpt from Revelations, Nikolai is wanting us to picture heaven. The gates made of pearl, the streets paved with gold. This idea that heaven being a glorious place to which we someday will. And also, Nikolai refers to this beautiful verse from Corinthians, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Now, I mentioned earlier that Nikolai wrote this in response to the student, Wilhelm Ernst, and as was common in this time period, composers often hid little clues or little symbols in homage to others. So if we look at the German words, which of course what Nikolai would have written them in, there are three verses. And you'll see, Wacht auf is the first verse. Zion hört die Wachter singen is the second verse. Gloria sei dir gesungen is the third verse. And what he has done is he has made an acrostic backwards, Graf, son, 
to Baldek, the son of Baldek. So in the way that he used the words of the, of the various verses, he has written a homage to his student. In the other hymn of this time that he wrote, um, there are eight verses, and it spells out his whole name, which is very, very cool when you see it. I was going to talk to you about the structure, the musical structure of this piece, because I find those things interesting. I'm not sure you would find it as interesting as me. And if you'd like to talk about it, I'd be happy to do that with you. But as I've been reflecting on this wonderful hymn, and Nikolai thinking about his own death he possibly faced in this pandemic, I've been thinking a lot about what others who have been in situations where imminent death was probable. How did they think for themselves about their coming death? And how did they prepare like the wise maidens? I think about the soldiers in World War I who stood in the trenches. What went through their mind as they waited for their turn to go up over the top, knowing that in no man's land their chance of survival was very slim? What went through the minds of our World War II soldiers on that fateful day in 1944 when they stormed the beaches of Normandy? as they rode the choppy waters of the English Channel in their crafts, many of them seasick, knowing that once they left their landing craft and scurried their way up the Juno Beach, their chance of survival was slim. And I wonder, too, about our frontline healthcare workers who every morning don their protective equipment to care for those who are ill or requiring testing? What goes through their minds each day as they contemplate that their actions to help others place them at risk? And then we have to stop and think a little bit about, well, many of us don't really think of ourselves, just like those foolish maidens, those foolish attendants in our story. Many of us know that this time in our life will come. But it's sometimes hard to be motivated to think about preparing for it. Sometimes it seems like that situation is a long time off. These last weeks of the church year, which remind us of the coming of the end, our own end, the world's end, are a really time of motivation for us to take that time to think. Remember Nikolai's preface where he says that this might be a comfort for other sufferers. I wonder if he ever imagined that 400 years later we would still be singing this hymn, reading these words, finding inspiration and comfort from his own meditation. I encourage you to think carefully at the words he so wisely wrote for us. And I'll invite the girls to share this music with you.
wakes, she rises from her gloom. Her dear friend comes down her glorious, a strong in grace and truth victorious. Her star is risen, her light is Would you please stand? Let us profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now for the prayers of the people. Longing for Christ's reign to come among us, we pray for the outpouring of God's power on the church, the world, and all in need. Holy God, rouse us deep praise as we gather for worship. Enliven our worship with sincere and heartfelt song. Sustain the work of all the church musicians and artists who lead us in praise and prayer. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy Creator, surprise and delight us with the beauty of the world you have made. Bless the work of landscapers, architects, and artists whose work invites us into harmonious living with your creation. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Holy Judge, let justice roll down like waters over this world. Reign over the courtrooms of every land, in the hearts of those who guard the law, and those who stand ac accused of crime. Be present in cases where we long for both justice and mercy to prevail. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy Companion, 
console those who feel lonely or abandoned, especially during this time of the pandemic, which forces us to stay more isolated. Share the hours of those who live and eat alone. Comfort those who have friends, who have few friends, or who struggle with their identity and place in this world. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy Protector, be with all observing Remembrance Day. Guard the lives of active duty and retired military personnel. Comfort all who mourn, those who have died in the line of duty. Heal the wound, both physical and mental, experienced by service members. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. For what else do the people of God pray? Hear us, O oh God, your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. Holy and immortal one, we pray in thanksgiving for the lives of all who have died. Remind us of the frailty and shortness of our own lives and inspire us to use them for the building up of your kingdom. Hear us, O oh God, your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior until the day when you gather all creation around your throne, where you will reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite those who are gathered to share the peace, uh, maintaining <laughs> social distancing. So. Peace. God's result. Thanks for your singing. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, this is usually the time where we pass the offering plate. Actually, I say usual. It hasn't been usual for several, several months. Uh, but uh, just a reminder, there's a, for those that are here in person, there's an offering plate there at the entrance. And those at home, there's a donate button on our website if you feel moved or would like to uh, give an offering. Um, let's see. Oh, we have more music. We know that the hymn, Wacket aufruft uns die Stimme, was very well received. It became a very popular very quickly. And the reason we know this is because composers um, took this hymn and used it in their writing. So Books de Hütte wrote an entire cantata using this hymn. Bach wrote a cantata and several other works based on this hymn tune. Mendelssohn, Max Rager, even into the 20th century, Hugo Distler. So I'm really excited that today Natalie and Michaela and Hannah will sing for us Bach's beautiful, beautiful setting of the second verse of the hymn, Zion Hears the Watchman Singing. This was written in cantata 140, and um, it's a, a beautiful setting of this beautiful melody.
Let us pray. God of all goodness, generations have turned to you, gathered around your table, and shared your abundant blessings. Number us among them that, as we gather these gifts from your abundance and give thanks for your rich blessings, we may feast upon your very self and care for all that you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our sovereign and servant. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A few announcements for those in person. Uh, as we leave here today, just to remind you to uh, maintain physical or social distancing. But I invite you, oh, it's awfully cold outside. <laughs> I was going to say, gather and talk outside, but that's going to be really hard. But just please be responsible so that we keep each other safe. For those on online, a reminder that we'll be gathering in the Zoom room. Uh, give us about 10 minutes after the end of the service for some fellowship time. And then uh, we'll have Sermon Talk back. And Catherine, uh, why am I blank? Glazer Climbing. <laughs> Sorry, Catherine, I blanked on your last name. <laughs> Cat Catherine will be joining us to, to, if you have any questions or any feedback as, as far as the, ser uh, the sermon. I invite those who are gathered to stand. May the God of all creation, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved, who strengthen, strengthens us for service, give you reason to rejoice and be glad. The blessing of God, Sovereign, Savior, and Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. And we're going to sing this last hymn for those that are gathered. Keep your mask on, though. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Hallelujah. 
Love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. 